All right, 6.34 p.m. Thursday, June 17th, 2021. I call board, board selection meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> we have a relatively short agenda tonight. This was originally intended to be just for uh, discussing the mass housing letter regarding the 40B um, work. But however, we had to stuff a few extra things in here because last meeting was pretty, pretty well packed. So the first thing we're gonna cover is um, uh, annual town meeting review. And this specifically is because we still have to decide who is going to be speaking on which of the articles. Now, um, <clears throat> so a quick run through board members. The ones that we have to, uh, we will be called upon to speak on are, and I'll read through all of these and then we'll go through them in, <clears throat> in, in order. Um, Article 4, which is the operational budget. Article 5, which is the capital budget. Article 6, which is a few small uh, specialized transfers. <clears throat> Article 7, which is the school budget. Article 8, which is the CPC. 11 is the <clears throat> uh, tobacco road um, uh, um, easement for Hamilton. Uh, and then 12 through 16 are citizens petition articles. 12 is the letter and uh, the article in opposition to the strategic land best uh, ventures <coughs> um, uh, project. 13 is a modification of the earth removal um, bylaw regulated to blasting. 14 um, is a modification of the public safety law for two access roads. 15 is a citizen's petition article um, regarding uh, dispatch, emergency dispatch. And 16th is a citizen's petition article regarding the zoning bylaw recodification. So um, <clears throat> I don't think that Alan's going to be here tonight, uh, but he had said that we just need to make a few, he would expect us to make a couple of uh, opening comments about the, the operational budgets and the capital budgets. So let's take our four and five together. Um, <clears throat> who um, would like to speak on these ones. Eli, did I, yeah, Becky? did I miss something? I didn't hear you. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Which one, are the, are the op -ex? Article Say that four? again. You'll do article four? Yeah. Sure. Right. So that's Becky. <clears throat> and Article 5, CapEx. <clears throat> uh, I'll do that, Eli, although I'm not just, is this like a couple of one-liners that we've got to come up with? Because I haven't done this before. Yeah, um, Greg can help you. Um, okay. It's basically introducing the article, introducing the major points of the capital projects, maybe a little bit of um, <clears throat> uh, comment about the capital projects that we've uh, done in the past and the ones that we have outstanding in the future. Um, <clears throat> Alan is pretty strict about keeping the uh, discussion to two minutes, and for this, he'll probably want it less than that. I'll comply with that. So, Eli, just on, on both Article 4 and 5, um, you know, pulling out some of the highlights that are in the finance committee report is um, is probably a good a good strategy. Yep. Uh, article six is a set of small transfers, and Alan had suggested that we just use Greg for to answer questions on that, so we don't actually need to speak to that one. <clears throat> uh, article seven on the school budget um, uh, that is going to be. Um, introduced by members of the school district. Um, and I don't think that we, I don't think that Alan was asking us to speak to that one. Um, <clears throat> Article eight is the CPC um, budget and that one typically uh, Sue Thorne or, or Jack Burke will speak to. So we don't have to speak to that one either. 11. Is the Chewbacca Road easements? I'll be glad to do that. Uh, Ann Harrison. All right. <clears throat> All right. Now we're on to the system petition articles. Um, 
And I'm going to go through these one by one and discuss what we talked about at our last meetings on these when we and when we last talked about our taking our positions on them. <clears throat> so on the the Eli, may I, um, yeah, sure. Do we need to say who's seconding now or not? No, um, that's already okay. been documented, written up, and I believe printed. <clears throat> so. Okay. I thought that Alan already had those. Maybe I'm wrong. But, well, but the he has this, he has both moving movers and seconders, but we've kind of changed the movers and second the movers a little. Well, then typically, what we would do um, is uh, we would the mover would be the speaker. Uh huh. So, right. Um, okay. So if we want to do that, then we'll say that the movers are the speakers for these particular articles and the seconders um, on uh, OPEX. Uh, I think Greg had sent around some proposed seconders. Shall we just leave them as they are? I might change it just a little bit depending on the movers. All right. Uh, so, Article Four and Five. Um, <clears throat> Sarah Mellish was seconding that one because of FinCom. She's yeah. the chair of FinCom, so we'll make uh, Becky <clears throat> um, be the mover on that one. Article Five, right. um, the same thing. We'll make John Round the mover and Sarah Mellish the seconder. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we're not changing the speakers for six, seven, or eight. So Chewbacca was Article 11. We had uh, John Round and Becky Jakes. So we'll change the mover to Ann Harrison. We're good so far. So now let's move on to um, yep. Article 12. <clears throat> All right, Article 12 was the um, citizens petition article regarding opposition to the SLV project. And <clears throat> when we talked about this, a few weeks ago, uh, the Board of Selectmen voted to take no position on this because we're still in the process of debating and submitting our public comment letter to Mass Housing, which is due June 24th, which is actually after um, the annual town meeting. And so we decided not to take a position on that based on that um, basic technicality. <clears throat> and I think that uh, that's all we really have to explain at the meeting <clears throat> and let the, uh, this is a non-binding, um, <clears throat> Uh, statement of position by the town. So uh, I think that's the only comment that really needs to be made uh, at, at the meeting. So who would who would like to be a uh, speaker for that? I'll do that. Yes. And may I just make a note that um, the last, the spelling of Ashley Oaks last name, the last name is incorrect on this. I think the proper spelling is O C H E S, I believe, mm -hmm. not O A K E S. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and the same for Article 13. Okay, so Article 13, uh, earth removal. <clears throat> this is a modification of the uh, um, earth removal bylaws. And the Board of Selectmen, uh, when we voted on this, recommended the advice of the Planning Board because it's the Planning Board that will have the oversight on this per the bylaw. Uh, and they, they already have the oversight on the uh, earth removal bylaw anyway. They're supposed to adjudicate any of the hearings related to it. Um, <clears throat> so we had asked for the uh, Planning Board to um, give their opinion on it and we would recommend their advice. Um, <clears throat> So um, I, that's uh, really all that we would have to say on this. And uh, unless the uh, planning board um, elects not to uh, take a position on this. Greg, uh, <clears throat> I was gonna ask you earlier where the uh, planning board now stood on this. My understanding is they, they voted to not recommend um, going forward with this article as they felt that blasting was already uh, heavily regulated by the state. 
All right. So, um, um, if the planning board is asked to discuss this, they can, they probably will be um, at Alan's discretion. But in any case, a member from the board of selectmen needs to speak on this, um, basically stating why we took our position the way we took it. Happy to, Becky. if need be. I, I can do that because it's in line with the previous. Are you going to do 12 as well then? 12 and 13. Okay. All right. Having a few <clears throat> lagging issues with my cell service. <clears throat> All right, Article 14 is the um, change to the public safety bylaw regarding two access roads. And at our meeting when we voted on this, we voted not uh, recommending not approval, not approving this um, article because this is really more appropriate to, we felt it was more appropriate to zoning bylaw and should have gone through a public hearing process with the planning board per our normal zoning bylaw process. And <clears throat> Uh, that was really basically it. Um, we, we didn't take a position on the um, safety issue per se, just the um, um, <clears throat> particulars of it being in the general bylaw as opposed to the zoning bylaw. Um, so, um, Sure. Becky, who was that? Ann? That was Ann. me. Go Ann. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Article 15 was dispatch. And uh, we recommended not approving because we're still in the middle of engaging the public on the topic and um, <clears throat> trying to provide them with uh, some more of the information that we have and that they may not have and get, well, solicit feedback from them. Um, <clears throat> so premature, uh, we felt to, to make a decision on, on dispatch. And this again is an advisory, uh, a non-binding vote from town meeting. Uh, I am happy to speak to this if people want me to. I got sure. it. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you'll Go make for it, Eli. Money. Yeah. And the last one is Article 16, which is the zoning bylaw recodification. And I believe that that is going to be passed over. The last I heard, it was going to be passed over. Um, and assuming that it is, we're not going to have to speak to it. So um, why, don't, why don't we do this? If, uh, if for whatever reason it doesn't have to be passed over, I'll speak to it. Um, <clears throat> we, we actually recommended passing over the article. <clears throat> And just to be clear, we recommended passing over it. Well, well, it's it's uh, moved at this point um, because there are no zoning code for uh, zoning bylaw recodification articles on the on the warrant. <clears throat> so let's just stick with that. There's no reason, I, as far as I know, there's not going to be any need for anybody to stand up and speak to this. All right, so uh, can, uh, hmm? go ahead, Jeff. Can we come back just one moment to the language on um, Article 11? Um, it says at the bottom of it, per petition of the Board of Selectmen, and then it says we take no position, and then it says the Board of Selectmen recommends approval. I hope that's not how it's written on the warrant. Uh, Article 11. Uh, <laughs> Do we take? Uh, no, do we, do we take, take? Go ahead. <laughs> we take means that the 
Finance Committee. This is the, from the Finance Committee report. Okay. So we, in this case, is the Finance Committee and not the Board of Selectmen. Thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> All right, um, good to go. Okay, Alan will restrict comments to two minutes. Um, many of these hopefully will need this. 17? No, 17 doesn't need a speaker. Um, 17 okay. is a uh, 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 pro forma um, article that's placed at the end to make any adjustments to the um, <clears throat> Um, uh, tax rate or to transfer any funds depending on how the votes played out in, during town meeting and we typically end up um, passing it over because we don't have to make any adjustments. <clears throat> okay, super. Thank you. All right, so we're good to go. I will um, zip this list off to Alan. And we can no pen. That's a pen. So it sounds like um, it, it will not be necessary to have a, a meeting right before the, the annual time meeting starts. Right. Um, <clears throat> is there any way that we would? Um, well, <clears throat> Um, so the only reason we might is technically the planning board is meeting on Saturday. Is there anything that might come out of that that would require us to? Why don't we post and cancel rather than yeah. panic? Yeah. <clears throat> So post for half an hour prior, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, we would probably be in, in a meeting room in the in the high school and can be in there for if we need to. Yep. <clears throat> oh, I'm gonna miss the days when we sat in the first grade room on the little bitty chairs <clears throat> for the <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to item two on the agenda. Short-term paying guest applications. We have two, one for um, <clears throat> number one, Bridge Street, and one for 16 Forest Street, number two. <clears throat> and we're gonna do 16 Forest Street, number two first. <clears throat> um, this is an application from Stephen Martin. Um, <clears throat> for um, well, 16 Forest Street, uh, uh, three bedrooms, one and a half bath. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> Mr. Martin, we have you here tonight. Do you wanna talk about this application a little bit? Uh, no, just going through the process. Um, uh, Sonia reached out to me a few months ago and um, I guess if I want to rent it less than six nights, then there's a formal application. I think I went, you know, did all the requirements, but she just wanted me to jump on here for one last, any questions you guys might have. All right, board members, you've got questions. I have a question about the parking. Yep. Um, Mr. Martin, you said that you ha you know that there are two to three spots to park on the left side of the driveway. Um, is that for everybody in the house or just for that unit? Yeah, so it's actually a two family and I'm, I have two driveways. There's one on the right side and there's one on the left side. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> The, my tenants on the first floor, they have the entire driveway on the right. And then the, the short-term guests would have the entire driveway on the left. And you can probably put about two or three cars tandem in that driveway. And is there a turnaround within the driveway or do people have to back out onto forest? They back out. 
Um, just because that's, I mean, you're, you're still a bit of a ways before the stop sign and, and at a bit of a curve. And I want, I, I just, you know, it's never a good idea to back out. Okay. Is, um, I mean, is I, it I'm, possible? I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I've, I've no, been living I'm, there and that's, I mean, I live there too. So I, that's how I, I pull in and back out. Um, I, I hear what you're saying with cars coming around the corner there. But it's a little, it's probably a good 50 to 75 yards up the street. And now that you guys put the stop signs in there, the three-way stop sign, I think people are slowly catching on that there's a stop sign there. Excellent. Glad to hear that. So is the unit itself, at, do you actually have three units there then? No, I have two. So you live there. So I live there. I, all, I work a lot in Boston. And so I have a place in Boston and I kind of will, will be doing both um, locations. So do you have a tenant who's there all the time now and then you do the short term rental? Yes. So how often, I mean, because technically you're supposed to be living there. Yep. Um, but so so the, we're, go ahead, I'm sorry. Where, no, where do you, where are you living when the, when the part time, when you've got your tenant and the part time renters? Well, I work a lot in Boston. And so I stay in yep. Boston occasionally. But are you there when the short time renters are there? No. Okay. Just that, that's, that's a, um, essentially a prerequisite for short-term rentals. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm all done. Thank you. Okay. Right. Yeah, so, so I, I just want to clear, clear that up, Stephen. So you, you live in the apartment that you're looking for short-term. You will stay there when it's available. Correct. And when there are short-term renters, then you're staying in Boston, whether you like it or not. Correct, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, have, I have kids in town, they live three houses down the street, so I'm, I'm there, you know, I'm there quite Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I, I, I see how this is evolving, yep. Okay. Uh, not, another question. So, have you have you been doing short-term rentals for a while before you became aware of this uh, of this ruling? And I understand people become aware at different times. So, you've done it for a little bit, or yeah, this is the first that I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Okay. But you've 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 been renting it kind of ad hoc for a little while with this back and forth residential arrangement. Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. So, well, let me back up. Previously, I, I had somebody inquire about renting it. They were looking to move back from the area. They were in California. They needed a place to stay and they, they wanted to rent it for me for like 45 nights. And I, and, you know, because it's not less than six nights, I, I guess I didn't need an approval from that. Right. Um, so that's kind of what initiated it. And now that it was on Airbnb. That's when I got reached out. I got the letter. And if I wanted to do the six nights or less, that's what I'm here for. I don't have to do the six nights or less, but. Um, Greg, I'm not as familiar with this bylaw as I should be. Is it in fact, a requirement that the landlord be in residence when property is used for short-term rental? So we, we are not explicit about that. What it says is that it's designed for owner-occupied dwellings. But we don't explicitly say that the owner has to be there when the renter is there. Yeah. It, it's silent in that issue. 
Specifically, the language goes like this. <clears throat> it's in the applicability section, and it says the rental of residential premises to short-term paying guests is allowed in owner-occupied residential premises pursuant to being licensed in accordance with this bylaw and consistent with the Zantown zoning bylaw. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the question is, is in this uh, gray area, when do things start turning into um, a property where uh, it's owner occupied for one week out of the year and then short term rented the rest of the time? And where do we go um, if we uh, start down that slippery slope? Eli? Go ahead, Becky. Um, I seem to recall when that was crafted um, that bylaw and the intent was that it was supposed to have the owners there so that you're not an absentee land per land person um, and therefore you're not overseeing what's going on with short-term renters and I know it doesn't say it flat out but that's what the intention was this one <clears throat> Also, I would like to clarify the number of bedrooms. It, it, in the description, it says three bedrooms, but on the drawing, there are two bedrooms on level two and two bedrooms on level three. So that's four bedrooms. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's really uh, three. That, that bedroom on the top is more like an office. It's got the, you know, you can barely stand up there. Um, so I'm only using it as three. I don't want I don't want more than that there. Trust me. That's, okay. So my my drawing is kind of what could be there, but what's accurate in the listing is the three. So what furniture do you currently have in that one room? I mean, is it sort of? Well, it's it's locked. Okay. The bedroom is locked. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Gary Gilbert, did you have a comment or are you withdrawing it? Well, I would just add, if I could, um, Gary Gilbert, 11 Magnolia, out, that the standard for owner occupancy is pretty much 51% of the year. Um, if you want to exceed that, then I think you it's incumbent upon you to be um, more explicit in the law itself. Um, and then as far as the fourth bedroom, the building inspector is supposed to make an inspection here and there's a state standards for slope ceilings and for square footage requirements as to what defines a bedroom. So that could pretty easily be um, the opinion of the building inspector. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Can I just clarify that the, the, the drawing that I gave is, it, it's, it's not a very good drawing. Um, but in the description, the, ear, the Airbnb <laughs> listing itself is three. So I just want to clarify that it's three, not four. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want four. But yes, we could get the building inspector to verify that. The text of the application says three bedrooms and one and a half bathrooms. <clears throat> says master bathroom sleeps two adults, <clears throat> kids bedroom sleeps one, and kids bedroom sleeps one. Yeah. Board members have any additional questions? Mr. Martin, um, would you in fact be occupying um, that apartment 50% of the year? Yes. Not, not including times when it's rented for longer periods. You, you would be there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Eli, so I have a little bit of a conundrum here. 50, 51 percent, I can see uh, Mr. Martin is there 51 percent. But of course, he's never there 
when the short-term renters are there. So the short-term renters can be there. And I, I know you're kind of wading into this, Mr. Martin. You're not sure what the market is and how things are going. You've had certainly inquiries with the longer-term things. Yes. But not so much with the short-term things. But it's quite, it's quite feasible that you can be there. I understand more than 50% of the year, but still you'll never be there when the short-term folks are there. Correct. That's, I will, that, I will that, not that's be a, there when that's someone's certain, in the unit. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we're we're talking. You know, we, we got fall, spring, and winter. Where uh, you know, uh, I I understand not a whole lot's necessarily happening in those yeah. right now. It's probably kind of intense, but yeah. Um, but yes, my intention is that I actually plan to be there for probably sixty to seventy percent of the time. Oh, look. All right, so <clears throat> any other comments from board members? I move to approve the application for short-term um, rentals at uh, 16 Forest Street, number two. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, all call vote, Mr. Round? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Ms. Jakes? Yes. Mr. Bowen votes yes. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you very much. All right, let's move on to our second application. <clears throat> which is um, One Bridge Street um, by uh, Nicole and William Whittleby, Whittle, Whittlesey. Whittlesey. Did I get yes. that right? Whittlesey. Whittlesey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whittlesey. All right. Uh, <clears throat> you two want to give us a brief uh, overview of your application? Um, we just submitted this, this standard application asking for short term rentals. And I received an email back from Sonia saying to please attend this meeting tonight to answer any questions you may have. All right, so we'll ask the same question about uh, owner occupied or not on this one. <clears throat> Can you talk about how the, the property is held and how you're going to be renting it? So it's a, it's a one bedroom um, house, and we wanted to do some short term rentals here and there to sort of offset the costs of maintaining it um, and owning it. And um, we, we also have a house down the street that we could be at over the summertime, very, you know, just four or five houses away. And we did hire a property manager for when we are at home in Sherborne, which is you know, about an hour away. So where do you regularly live? Sherborne. But we are up in Manchester as often as we can in the summertime. And we are looking to move to Manchester permanently within the next couple of years. And that's why we begun this process with buying the properties. So you own two properties here. Are you going to be moving into one of them in, Man in Manchester? Yes, we actually have three. Um, and one of them is a two families. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> If your main residence is in Sherburne, it seems hard for us to, to categorize this as an owner-occupied house. Um, in Mr. Martin's case, it was pretty clear that he was living there most of the time. It sounds very much like you're not, and you generally won't be around. Um, 
uh, during the periods of time when it's going to be rented. Um, well, it's a one bedroom house, so you couldn't. You couldn't do that in, regardless. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we have hired a full time property manager who will who will manage it. And um, when and our, we're not there, when we're not there, and our goal is to relocate up there into one of our units, and which is two hundred yards away. Yeah. Board members have comments. Unfortunately, the bylaw doesn't say anything about property managers. Mind you, you can still rent it as long as you rent it for more than six nights. Well, that's that's something we're willing to do. You prefer not to. You'd like to have the flexibility to rent it shorter if need be. I understand. Um, but there were um, uh, there were compromises in, uh, made when we put the short-term paying guest um, bylaw in place, and those were made to um, you know, satisfy residents who were concerned overall about uh, um, lots of um, small air and B, B and popping up without um, uh, owners around to. Uh, generally watch out oh, and watch out over them. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't see a reading of this where the um, bylaw would apply in this particular case. Eli, if I may. Yeah, yeah Becky, go ahead. I also, I also have a concern with the lack of parking. Very little parking in that area. Um, especially if you don't have a town sticker. Um, and for people familiar with the area, that's um, a problematic intersection anyway. And um, I just, I think there are, well, I think it boils down to the fact that the bylaw doesn't provide for this. The the other one of the two family home we have has three off street parking spaces. Um, one would be designated for Bridge Street. Um, so there would be an off street parking spot available to our tenants. Okay, just in, in your description, it says there is no parking available to guests on your application. Yeah, well, I guess I had thought of it at the time when I filled out the application, but we do have yep. that nope. ab ability to do that. Good option. It's just a short walk. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, regardless, I don't think that we can entertain this under the uh, the way the short term game paying guest bylaw is written right now. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to make a motion. Location it can still be um, uh, rented. Uh, more than six days. It just doesn't apply under the short-term paying guest bylaw. Second. Second. All right. And we're all call any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Round. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Bob Martino. Just to clarify, yes vote is saying that this does not apply under the short-term law. That is correct. Yes. Uh, Ms. Jakes? Yes. Ms. Bowling votes yes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, sorry, but yes, you can still rent it <clears throat> uh, more than six days. It just doesn't apply. Uh, the bylaw just doesn't apply here. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for coming in this evening. And um, I'm going to move on to agenda item number three, which is board and committee reappointments. Um, so these are reappointments for members who are on boards already, who uh, whose terms are expiring, and um, wish have expressed a wish to be reappointed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through this list of people who wish to be reappointed and along with their terms. If there's any that 
um, <clears throat> board members want to hold or discuss, we can. And then if not, we'll take a motion to block vote these in. All right. <clears throat> um, Action Inc. Representative Gretchen Wood for a five-year term. These are all terms expiring in 2021, unless I say otherwise. Mm -hmm. So they will be <clears throat> terms to be reappoint uh, uh, for June of um, 2021, plus whatever term their um, uh, their uh, term is. So if it's a five-year term, then in 2026. Gretchen Wood's term would expire. If it's a three-year term, then in 2024, uh, term would expire, et cetera. All right, moving down the list, ADA committee, Lisa Bonneville and Gretchen Wood, both three-year terms. Affordable Housing Trust, Margaret Driscoll. Um, she is the Board of Selectmen's uh, dele uh, representer, or uh, the designee, that's the word. Um, this is a two-year term. Chris Olney from the Planning Board, Nancy Hammond from the Housing Authority, and Joan McDonald from the CPC. The Zoning Board of Appeals, Sarah Mellish for a three-year term. Also, Sean Zahn as the first alternate, um, and John Benares, um, all for three-year terms. There is an, a Another one, James Mitchell, who wishes to be reappointed for two years, <clears throat> also for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, Board of Assessors, Jeffrey McAvee, a three-year term. Uh, Bike and Pedestrian Committee, three-year terms for Ann Cal Amy Kalman, sorry, and Terry Kalman. <clears throat> I'll say this again, Amy Coleman and Terry Kalman. <clears throat> So we do have an Ann Kalman that works for Lazarus. It's not the same. Um, uh, emergency response committer, uh, coordinator, Todd Fitzgerald for a three year term. Um, community preservation committee, Jack Burke at large, um, three year term. Mark Weld from the FinComs, Joe Sabella from the HDC, Joan McDonald at large. Conservation Commission, Steve Gang as chairman, uh, Henry Ottinger. Uh, you know what, I'll take back the chairman because that's decided by the Conservation Committee. That's Steve Gang and Henry Ottinger. Council on Aging, Stephen uh, Gillespie, <clears throat> three-year term. Downtown Improvement Project Committee, these are all one-year terms. Steve Carhart, Kurt Zvetka, Zvetka, I'm gonna get this wrong, Zvetka. Uh, he's not here to tell me I'm wrong. Gar Morse, <clears throat> Linda Crosby, and Gordon Brewster, all one-year terms. Emergency Management Director is uh, Jason Cleary as the Assistant Director, one-year term. Um, <clears throat> Finance Committee, three-year terms. Peter Twining and uh, Albert M. Creighton III, also known as Maury. Harbor Advisory Committee, three-year terms. Stephen Lauber, Philip Lady. <clears throat> Uh, health, Board of Health, Paula Polo, Paula, Paula, Polo, Philius, three-year term. Historical, Historical District Commission, um, three-year terms. Joe Sabella, Richard Smith, Rosemary Costello, and Robert Coppola. Manchester Coastal Stream, three-year term for Francie Cottle. Uh, Memorial Day Observance Committee, <clears throat> one-year term for the American Legion uh, and the Legion Auxiliary. Manchester Energy Efficiency Programs Advisory Board, one-year terms. Dennis Dixon, Stephen Carr, Sean Stallings, David Walls, Andre Kuhnemann, and Carly Cook. Open Space and Recreation, three-year terms. Helen Bethel and Sheila Linehan. <clears throat> Parks and Recreation Committees, three-year terms. Sean Daly and Muffin Driscoll. Board of Registrars, three-year term. Bruce Warren. Seaside One Committee, three-year term, Merritt Miller. Shellfish Constable, one-year term for James Elder. Tree Warden, one-year term for Tom Henderson. Winter Field Committee, three-year terms for Matthew Brzezinski, Michael Carvello, and Sue Thorne. That's our list. Um, oh, no. Yes, it is our list. North have... Shore Task, Eli. What's that? Um, North Shore Task Force Rep. 
Christine Delici, Christina Delicio. Oh, I missed reading one. One year term for North Shore Task Force Rep, Christine Delicio from the planning board. <clears throat> Any questions or comments from board members? Any holds that they want to place in here? Nope. Got a motion? What's that? Actually, hold Just off. There's a, a question from a member of the public, JV. Uh, good evening, Eli Jack Burke, the uh, Community Preservation Committee. Uh, the Community Preservation Committee would respectfully ask that you stagger the at large. Um, uh, terms and we had su we suggest that you appoint if you choose to appoint me that it be for one year Joe McDonald for two years and Sue Fawn's vacated position for three years whoever you may choose to fill that position the other the other six positions are statutory and sometimes it those boards will take care of any turnover on their own but the board of selectmen uh, appoint the at large uh, specifically, and we'd like it to turn over maybe one per year rather than what's happened this year. All right. So, can you uh, read me your date request Jack, again? Jack Burke, one year. Joe McDonald, two year term, and the the vacant one three-year term, whoever you should choose to fill that position. Okay. So the change tonight would be currently we have Jack Burke, Mark Well, Joe Sabella, and John McDonald all as three-year terms. And what you're requesting is that it be Jack Burke for a one-year term, Mark Well for a three-year term, Joe Sabella for a three-year term, and okay. Joan McDonald for a two-year term. Accurate? Yep. Joe Sabella is, is not part of the at-large. He's a historic district rep. But his term is three years. Yes, but the, th the three I'm talking about is myself, Joe McDonald, and the vacant position. Right. And we're not doing the vacant positions tonight. Okay, so just myself and Joe. One year for me, two year for Joe, uh, Joe McDonald. Okay. Um, Greg, any comments on that? No, I think that's I think that's fine. Board members, comments? Makes sense. Yep. All right. Can I get a motion then to approve the block that I just stated along with Jack Burke's uh, recommendations for shifting the two at large terms? To so second. second. All right. That was second for Ann Harrison. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, roll call vote, Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> move on to item four on the agenda, which is a draft mass housing letter. <clears throat> Before we do this, I'm going to run over and close my window because somebody's mowing it out. Up. Okay, so we have a draft um, letter that um, I want to thank Greg and town staff for putting together for um, uh, to go to Mass Housing regarding the um, strategic land ventures application before Mass, Mass Housing um, for the 40B project. Um, and this will be uh, our, our opportunity to review it. We also have received letters from, um, well, a number of different places. We received some letters from um, some folks regarding uh, uh, trout species in the area. Uh, we've also received uh, uh, significant write-ups from the Manchester Essex um, Conservation Trust 
from the Citizens Initiative uh, um, for Affordable Housing and um, also from the Planning Board. <clears throat> And um, some of the, these comments have been incorporated into the um, uh, write-up that we are putting into mass housing. All of these letters will be included with our package to mass housing um, in their entirety. Um, <clears throat> so tonight when we go through this, um, oh, we also have some comments from, from John Witten that we received. Um, very recently, uh, but, uh, proposed edits to or options to um, the letters, the letter that Greg gave us in our packet. Um, <clears throat> so tonight, when we go through this, what I I don't want to do is go through a, uh, go through it line by line, looking at typos. If there are typos or other basic formatting issues. Just get those to Greg and we deal with them. What I want to do is deal with the content <clears throat> as much as we can tonight. And then uh, we'll have another meeting on the 22nd, which is Tuesday, to finalize <clears throat> or and vote on the final version of this letter. Um, <clears throat> now, I think what I would like to do is first go around the board members who've read um, Greg's letter and get general comments about um, the overall coverage, the direction, the tone, and um, uh, uh, get your your broad opinions about it. So let's let's start with that, and then we'll go around um, and go through the letter in more detail, uh, discussing discussing the individual sections and any comments that uh, around the content that you might have. Let's start with Ann Harris. I, I like it. Um, I have also read John Witten's. I find it John's suggestions to be very aggressive um, and probably unnecessary. Uh, I think the order, um, the the fact that this project does not meet the sustainable. Sustainability development principles is the strongest, is a very strong argument. Um, and I like the fact that it starts by introducing, then listing what we're going to talk about, then talking about it, and at the end saying what we talked about it. Good structure. And that's my opinion. All right, John Round. Yeah, and I, I, I want to add uh, kudos to Greg and his staff. I'm, uh, you know, this was a lot of work to try and put this, put this, uh, put this letter together. And I, I looked through the whole thing, and I also looked through uh, John Jonathan Witten's comments, which are were very pointed. I agree with Ann; they are uh, pointed. And but he he did make the statement that they have to be. Uh, we've never seen other letters that have gone to the uh, gone to mass housing for uh, eligibility, but he says, you've got to be really much, pretty much in their face to make any kind of an impression. I will take his advice on that. I had a couple of uh, questions. Well, one, first of all, and it's process, and I don't know if anybody here, if, if you, Eli or Greg know, is a decision from mass housing with regard to an eligibility letter appealable? <laughs> Uh, not that I am aware of. Um, I think that the once they get their project uh, PL, they're they're ready to go to the zoning board appeals. Great. Right, and the decision there is appealable. But I'm wondering if at this step something is appealable. Well, there's um, not a formal process for that, John. Um, Attorney Witten did tell me that he was aware of one time when. Um, uh, project eligibility letter was taken to court um, and the courts basically said mass housing is a, is a banking uh, institution and therefore an appeal was not germane. Okay, okay. So um, there, there are only two areas where uh, I, I, we did not have a lot of time to go, go through this and, and go through the details, but two points. 
that I, I just wanted to kind of address. And one was the issue of uh, this being financially unfeasible. And certainly Witten does address that and say it, it's not. I don't think that's our concern, but I think our concern and I, I, is that if it is financially uh, unfeasible, financially troubled properties tend to be neglected, understaffed, creates problems for residents, et cetera, et cetera. And I think something to that effect needs to be put in there to draw a line. This is what our concern is. Whether the investors are making money or not is not our concern. Mass housing knows that. I think all of the players here are, are, are aware of that. But um, I'd like to see something along those lines. Um, and the other thing, I just looked in a couple of spots and uh, there is a concern about developing Shingle Hill entirely. I mean, the message comes through, we don't wanna see anything going on there. Yet we say it's in a limited, limited commercial district. And by definition, we might be interested in development in some other way. Now, not necessarily people living there, but there are other factors. Uh, if the factors that affect, are affected most by people living there are taken away, uh, you know, if something else is built there, not that it's easy to build anything on that spot. Um, I think that anybody reading the letter would say, well, this is a little bit disingenuous. In fact, you just don't want anything to be built there when in fact our concern is primarily dealing with um, residential building there. And I'm not sure where that message can kind of come through, but that was my other observation. But overall, I thought it was I thought it was good, and I would I would stick with uh, pretty much most of uh, Mr. Witten's uh, comments to it. Jeff, <clears throat> uh, I would echo the um, kudos to the staff that put this letter together, um, and under Greg's guidance and leadership and John Witten's input. Um, we can come back to the issue of John's tone and the tone in this as we go further into this discussion. Um, I, I was particularly concerned about um, in the six different areas. I agree with John's comments about, I, I really felt like there was a um, juxtaposition of limited commercial district and, and this is not a good place. It, it constrains the limited commercial district. I think that argument is is not a good argument um, because uh, you know we at one point had talked about the and it's on record um, that this might be um, integrated into the little limited commercial district as the residential portion. Um, so I I would like to stay away from that and and focus on um, the uh, sustainability. Um, the uh, incompatibility with our uh, housing production plan, um, the environmental de degradation, and the safety concerns. And in the area of safety concerns, um, the highlight was on um, disaster safety, uh, two-way access, um, the terrain and the developer being uh, uh, obstacles to developing two-way access. Um, to the property, um, and much less so in terms of, it's stated in the beginning about no internal sidewalks or bike lanes. Um, there's nothing on that in the body of the letter um, in terms of pedestrian. Well, there's very little of it in terms of pedestrian access and particularly disabled pedestrian access. So um, I'd like to see that beefed up just a little bit. Other than that, I think it's a great job. Um, okay, I'll probably come back to you when we're talking about beefing up the, um, uh, the letter with regard to sidewalks, but uh, let's, let's, let's keep with the general comments and go on to Becky now. Um, I would agree and in, in saying thank you very much for a, a well well done effort and job with the letter. Um, I think that, that in going before mass housing, I am 
very comfortable following John Witten. He has just vast amounts of experience in this. And if he thinks uh, a, a strong tone is, is warranted, I would be inclined to follow his recommendation there. Um, I think one of, aside from the more, the obvious being um, safety, environmental and sustainability, um, when it comes to actually financing this project uh, and, and looking at the numbers and the Fed now making noises of potentially raising interest rates, I, I would love to find a way to say, have them, okay, if mass housing is going to approve this and it dies on the vine after everything's been blasted um, and we're left with a gaping hole and no water runoff mitigation, anything like that, I just, I think that, that um, I just don't think we can focus on the financial aspects of this and, and the fact that it's what a potential 60 year payback for before any profit is realized. How, anyway, um, I, I would stress as much as possible the lack of real financial feasibility. It's, I mean, just this, especially going in front of mass housing uh, when I, anyway, there you go. Okay. All right, uh, my turn. So let's see, I'll start with, um, I guess I'll start with John Witten's comments. Some of his comments I thought were uh, fairly germane and, and helpful, in particular, some of his comments later on in the document, and I'll get back to those later on in the discussion. Um, uh, so I, I'm of mixed minds about this. I'm, I was ex I'm extremely grateful for John Witten's guidance and um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, legal leadership through the... Um, the negotiation process that we went through and his education of us along the way. Uh, I will note that ultimately at the bottom, this letter is signed by me. <clears throat> and um, uh, some of the tone the language coming from the uh, proposed by John Witten um, is not what would come out of me. <clears throat> and I think it is um, aggressive without necessarily having a point to that aggression. Um, <clears throat> I don't like to second guess him in that respect, but this board letter is from us. And um, some of the initial <clears throat> um, uh, comments are, I think, a little bit over the top. So I would probably tone them down a little bit. Um, in, in my approach here. Uh, with regard to the comment, uh, the overall content, <clears throat> I was uh, completely on board with the, all the, the six major areas and the six major areas were um, <clears throat> failure to meet, meet the sustainability development principles, um, overturning local zoning, uh, incompatible with our local housing production plan, financially unfeasible, um, <clears throat> Uh, the environmental degradation and the safety concerns. Those are all areas, um, well, many of those are areas that we were attempting to negotiate in the LIP and um, we had reason to do so. Um, <clears throat> one area where uh, other board members have commented and I, I will too is on the uh, section in overturning local zoning and the, the, the discussion about the proposal being in a section of town, uh, of town zone for limited commercial development. Um, I would modify the approach that is taken here a little bit um, <clears throat> by saying that the proposed development would actually, um, it would foreclose on some of our ability to uh, 
uh, do possible mixed use housing uh, in an area where we have been undertaking zoning uh, recodification efforts and um, planning efforts for some time now. And um, it's in town, we think it's in the town's best interest to continue down the path of uh, uh, doing a better plan for the limited commercial district that um, is harmonious. And this development uh, doesn't really contribute to that and would limit our ability to enact what we think is um, an appropriate um, vision of the master plan. Um, <clears throat> so those are my, my high level comments. Um, so, uh, and as far as the fiscal financially unfeasible uh, aspect, I think it's definitely worth pointing this out here because um, <clears throat> we do run the risk of the project not ending up being what it um, is proposed to be <clears throat> if, um, if the, the finances are significantly far off from <clears throat> what the developer has stated they are. And that's something that I think should be raised to mass housing now and should be something that's taken into consideration by the Zoning Board of Appeals when it ultimately gets them. Um, okay, so those are my main comments. So we differ a little bit at the board level now on how we wanna approach the comments from John Witten. And what I would propose is that we handle that aspect of the conversation and a little bit further on in our discussion because this, he didn't change the structure of the document very much. He just um, changed some of the introductory language and some of the, the comments um, in the middle of the document. Um, <clears throat> instead, what I would like to do is um, discuss some of the, the specific points that board members raised. Uh, the principal one was around the um, um, limited commercial district, and the uh, other one was a comment that Jeff made around the safety and sidewalks. I think those are the two main ones. Um, and if people want to have further discussion around fiscal uh, or financial feasibility, we can do that. But let's for the time being, let's start with the limited commercial district and um, I'll talk about that a little bit. And before I move on, so, uh, how is my audio? Is the, the weed trimmer outside causing anybody distress? Can't hear no? it. Excellent. I didn't hear it. I'm not gonna worry about it now. You should tell him to come in. Yeah, no, it'll stop soon, it's gonna get dark. Send them my way. Uh, all right, so um, so in the letter that was, uh, I'm going to uh, zero, zero on it. I'm going to focus down on this one section on uh, overturning local uh, zoning, and I'll read the section about um, uh, the summarization of it first. And so the concern, the key aspects that made the, make the project inappropriate are, well, one of them is that it overturns uh, local zoning. The proposal is in a section of town zone for limited commercial development. And this is not a just not just a request for graded housing density, but a request to put housing where no housing is allowed by local zoning. And then, um, in the detail section, um, it says this is inconsistent with our local zoning and housing production plan. And. Um, the proposal not only seeks a much higher level density, but also housing in an area zone for limited commercial uses only. There are no uh, residential units in this part of town. In fact, the large majority of the limited commercial district consists of parcels permanently conserved as natural areas. Town zones this area for limited uses due to the abundance of natural resources in the area, particularly its water resources as it serves as a major water recharge area serving the town's drinking water well, <coughs> principal drinking water well. And the area includes numerous state map vernal pool, pools, rare and endangered species, and other significant natural resources. The project site includes 
vernal pools and large wetlands, thus to grant the large, the high density residential use goes completely against the local planning efforts that have been underway for decades. Um, <clears throat> So this is an area where I think we could spend a, a little bit of time uh, on the content. So board members have comments here. Is this, is this, first of all, is this, I know some several board members commented on, is this the area that uh, uh, board members really wanted to focus on in this respect? And if so, can you give comments? Eli, may I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Becky. With mass housing um, and their perspective, um, how much do they care if this doesn't fit our local zoning? Well, that's, um, I think, part of my point. They don't, I don't think they do care. Um, that's where I'm going. But um, the reason, that's sort of the reason why, in part, why I felt that it was, I, I think what they would care about in part is that the town is making efforts to um, uh, discuss options for mixed use development up there. So right. some of the proposals that are being have been put forth up there involve um, commercial mixed use commercial and housing. And those are efforts that have been are intended to be much more cooperatively negotiated and worked out with the town and carefully planned. And in fact, we've been holding multiple forums and discussions at the planning board level about how, how we want to approach that um, in a, a fairly uh, methodical manner. And this proposal, um, this development proposal undercuts that because we can support a certain amount of housing, but not um, uh, if this development were to go in, it would eliminate it would foreclose upon options for doing some housing um, <clears throat> in the limited commercial district that we might otherwise be considering. And uh, uh, that uh, that's not us trying to get out of um, building housing. It's try us, uh, us trying to uh, have control over it. I guess... I don't understand how SLV building housing keeps us from building other housing. Well, um, it, it doesn't, except that um, <clears throat> I think it seems fairly obvious that if we built 130 housing units that were purely residential and then built another 130 or another 100 or proposed another 100 elsewhere, um, that would, uh, I think that would meet with a considerable amount of um, <clears throat> pushback from the community and uh, concern over the stress that that would induce on the school system and the police. We already have that problem with the 40B as it stands. So, there's a limited amount of um, uh, resources in town and to um, soak it all up with this one development on top of Shingle Hill is not, um, it's not at all ideal for us. Nor is it ideal for the people left out at the other end. I mean, way out there. But the rest of the limited commercial district is just as far out there. Yep. Yeah. That's mixed use. Yeah, but that mixed Possibly. use is, is fifty per, is fifty percent residential. That's what LCD requires. 
Well, it's not that it's LCD requires that. It's if we end up going for a 40R, but we don't need to go down this road. 40R yeah. is what requires that. Mm -hmm. That's that's correct. You're right. <clears throat> so um <clears throat> Other board members with comments on um, this particular area. Is this is this a section that uh, have I named the right section that people had concerns about in the LCD and the language that the people had concerned about? Although we're not agreeing yet on <clears throat> what really ought to go in there. Mm -hmm. It is, Eli, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that as written, um, this this section speaks more towards environmental degradation and the threat to the water supply um, than it does wrapping the LCD in there and the zoning issues in there, uh, ignoring the zoning issues uh, for local zoning um, and the housing production plan um, seems a very weak argument to me. Um, the strength of, of what's said here has to do with the threat to the um, town water supply and in terms of where this particular project is located um, because as Ann said we're talking about building residential units in that same area um, possibly building residential units in that same area but putting them in a place that's much less of a threat to the local uh, water supply um, so I I'm, I'm not sure as written that this delivers the punch that we want to deliver in regard to um, the uh, inconsistency with the housing production plan. Um, the inconsistency with local zoning, it's a very weak argument because we're talking about possibly putting residential in that area anyway. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with Jeff's comment there. In other words, putting housing in an area zone for limited commercial uses only, that's not a strong statement. <laughs> you know, put it, putting it on, putting it in an area that can affect the water supply, that is a stronger story. But, um, but that's not what this is trying to address. No. This is trying to address the housing production plan and overriding long-term planning efforts for local zoning. You can do that, I think, can't you, without without bringing in the LCD? I think that, that um, you know, our housing production plan is trying to work on other uses as well as in, in that area, rather than just saying that um, it's a limited commercial district, therefore, even though that is completely accurate right now, there is no, it's not zoned for housing right now. Hmm. Maybe we could just drop point two and take the substance of it. Um, the natural resources into the environmental section um, and the housing production plan into the town into into number three. I would agree with that. Ann. That seems reasonable. That I had I had a meta issue, which I sent in separately. Um, I was uncomfortable uncomfor with simultaneously saying that this place is tremendously ecologically sensitive, and we're planning to put a commercial development there. Say that again. Sorry. I was didn't articulate it as well in the email that I sent, but 
we seem to be simultaneously arguing that this location is tremendously environmentally se sensitive and very difficult to develop, and that we were saving it for commercial development. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I, th I think we've found a way around that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. All right. Uh, any other board members or comments on the um, uh, limited commercial district area and the housing production plan? All right. <clears throat> Um, Greg, did you have any comments there? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, com I'm comfortable with what people are saying. Um, I, I, All right. I think he... Then I th think what I'd like to do is move on to the <clears throat> public safety section. Um, and here, maybe what we'll do is... Um, We'll include discussion from board members on um, John Witten's comments as well as Jeff's discussion about sidewalks here, because here I think <coughs> uh, John Witten was offering more content, and while the language was a little sharp, there was more content in here that was I thought um, valuable. So let's take it we'll take it all together. And this is section six on public safety threats, including John Witten's comments. So um, Jeff, do you want to go first since you brought up the issue about sidewalks and, and uh, a lack of attention to um, discussion in here? I should point out um, <clears throat> We uh, do point out in this document that uh, our complete streets, I think we referred to complete streets in your policy, <clears throat> um, uh, does call for us to extend sidewalks into the area um, as it's developed. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> therefore, um, uh, we think it's appropriate for the the site to have some sort of pedestrian support. Can can I suggest that we split six into two? Um, one being accessibility, and the second mm -hmm. being danger. Yep, good idea. That is a little awkward because we need to split the traffic en engineer into danger and and accommodation for walkers and bikers. I I, I at first I said I thought what you just said made a lot of sense, Anne, um, but I'm concerned that it separates the safety of safety. Um, of walkers and bikers and their accessibility to the site, both leaving and coming. Um, it separates that from public safety and that's a public safety issue. Um, you try and bring a wheelchair up that, that hill, that's a public safety issue. Um, not in the sense of, of ambulance or fire or police access. Maybe, maybe we want to say safety and then disaster find some slightly more elegant word than disaster, but um, urgencies or something. Yeah. Hmm. 
but along those lines, um, in terms of the sidewalk, don't we need to, um, I think for the complete streets, shouldn't we extend that sidewalk now? Say we have a commitment and do it. Well, I think the policy is actually, um, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the policy was more when we do um, uh, development, uh, if a development is put in or if we um, do uh, work running uh, utilities um, under those circumstances, we set as a policy that we would extend sidewalks to cover the affected area. Um, do you want to clarify that for us, Greg? That, that's correct. Typically, it's, it's sort of when, when we touch a street, that's when we um, no. take a hard look at doing a better job with bike and ped pedestrian uh, um, accommodations. Thank you. So, so when they put um, a water line in there, they're going to need to tear up a chunk of the street. And we will, according to our policy, at that point, since it's going to a development, be um, uh, following the policy that we voted on and extending a sidewalk out there. That's what our intent would be. So, Jeff, did you? Um, I, I think I think that Ann's point is a good one, and um, the the traffic engineer, um, as it's being, as his work is being uh, uh, presented, both in in the original letter and in in, in John Witten's recommendations for the letter. Um, does need to be separated uh, and more strength put into for the um, public safety issues, more strength being put into that mm -hmm. than just a comment about yeah. the curvilinear nature of the driveway. Um, and the second part of that does, does address the second part of that paragraph um, or in John's uh, John's write up, it's all in one paragraph, um, recommending accommodations for walkers and bikers um, and how difficult that is given the slope of the roadway. Um, so I, I, I think that, that separating the two things out is, is possible. Um, I don't wanna dilute the importance of what the traffic engineer had to say. Um, but I do want to highlight with greater strength what the traffic engineer said about a second access, because that's what he said. And I don't see that if, if, if I'm, unless I'm wrong about that, and I don't think I am, um, I don't even see that mentioned in here about a second secondary access. In where mentioned? In the letter. In John, well, it's it is talked about in that doesn't doesn't Why? didn't Greg put in that it's uh about the one that was re rejected because it only had one egress. It talks about it in terms of our local regulations, but I think that the traffic safety engineer also raised this issue, and well, um, I don't I don't see that being highlighted. Oh, okay. So you're not talking about in paragraph three sentence two under number six where it says in Lexington Woods versus Waltham. No, I'm talking about um, paragraph one. Our study. Um, that says our local regulations call for at least two access points for projects over 20 units. Yep. Um, and, um, and then goes on to the traffic engineer, but the traffic mm -hmm. engineer agreed with that, in fact, underscored that as an issue and saying that uh, yep. a second access was necessary. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Mr. Engler and SLV really downplayed that part of the report. 
Well, what about, it does say the town hired in, in paragraph two. Am I just not understanding you, Jeff? I'm sorry. It's probably long, the case yeah. that I'm not being clear, Becky. <laughs> Either um, that or my hearing aids aren't working that well today. Uh-huh. Um, in paragraph number two, the traffic engineer's report is referenced. There's one sentence that says, Okay. That he highlighted a concern over just one access road and the curvilinear, steep curvilinear nature of the driveway. But the next, the rest of the paragraph is about accessibility by pedestrians and bikes. Right, right. Um, I think that we need to highlight more, more strongly the language of the traffic engineer, which said this, this site needs a second access. Unless I'm totally wrong in the way that he presented his information, and I believe that he presented it as such. It's not just that he highlighted the concern over one access road. He said it needs a secondary access road for public safety purposes. Yeah. Is that correct, Greg? Greg, you're, you're muted. Yeah, that, that's correct. We can, we can certainly expand on that. Just, just to strengthen that aspect of what he says. Mm -hmm. And that's where Ian's point about mm -hmm. maybe separating these two issues of pedestrian and bike access uh, and disabled people's access and um, public safety emergencies um, may be, a, may be a, 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 sol a more solid point, even though we have to split up what the traffic engineer says. I don't think that's as much of a problem as no. And founding this or diluting the issues by saying he said this, he said that. Mm -hmm. So I'm agreeing with Ann again. I saw that eye roll. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would also like. Um, to have a final paragraph after the after the safety, just hammering. You know, we have these six items that we each of which we think disqualifies the project. Just so that there's a summary. Yeah. Yeah, I like that idea. Uh, All right. Um, I think we covered the two main areas where board members had um, disagreements or um, thoughts about the content. Um, now I'd like to go back, unless people have further comments on this particular section. And by the way, um, uh, the, my, my intent here is that we give these this uh, a comparatively high level guidance to Greg and um, uh, we'll get another version of this out. Um, and then we'll do our final review in the meeting on the 22nd. I think that's all we'll have in the meeting on the 22nd. Then we'll be going through with a fine tooth comb um, beginning to end typos the whole whole kit and caboodle with an objective of getting the mm -hmm. final final document approved on that night um, so that'll just be a straight up editing session so um, so uh, the remaining aspects are I wanted to go back and cover um, the tone and language of John Witten's proposed comments and 
um, get some resolution um, from the board about how far we want to take it with those comments. Um, I don't want to go through and, and review each of the editorial uh, or editorialize on those comments tonight. I think it'll be picky and and not productive. I'd like to characterize what we um, support and don't, and then <clears throat> let um, Greg and myself take a pass at uh, moderating or unmoderating those comments, and then get a new new copy out to people. So that's the one one thing I would like to do. <clears throat> that's what I'm proposing. Second thing. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Uh, we've received an, the number of letters that I already cited from the, from the main ones, the big ones, from the planning board, from MECT, and um, from SEMA, uh, all of which were very detailed. And I'd, I'd like to recognize the amount of time and effort that those um, three letters clearly took to put together. Um, and what I'd like to ask board members is, um, have we missed any of the content from those letters that we think those, those letters will go to mass housing regardless, but have we missed any of the content of those letters that they th think ought to be included or addressed or, um, <clears throat> or seconded and supported in, in our letter? I have a question, Eli. Did, did anything ever come of uh, the, there was some study of vernal pools that was going to occur in the spring? And I did not see that content or comment on it, I think, in any of the letters. Uh, Greg? Greg? Uh, so they, they did do those studies. Um, they did find um, you know, confirmation of the, of the existing vernal pools. Um, but I, my understanding is there are no Verna pools found in the proposed um, construction site. And the footprint, yeah. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll double check that, but that's my understanding. Okay. As If I may, Eli, um, I was on the meeting for when, that, when that came in and correct me, Greg, if this doesn't sound right, they actually found um, a surprising number of eggs of the 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 salamander the spotted salamander what they found is the 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 yellow more of the yellow and fewer not so much the blue the blue is the one that's the the critically endangered one from my understanding mm -hmm. um but they they were surprised at just how many eggs were there they had not anticipated that number and i guess the issues um where the vernal pools were were located was where the runoff would be and how how would it be possible to mitigate the runoff into the areas where those vernal pools were? And Ron, Ron Master Giacomo might be on this and might have some info on that. I'll follow up also with, with the ConCom and make sure I have those details. Any other areas where um, people think we uh, need to include specific elements that we didn't otherwise cover um, in our broad comments? Specific elements of the letters that yes others yes. provided to us. Yeah. Um, I I was um, impressed with. Uh, the comments of the hydrologist Scott Horsley that uh, Mech tired. Um, uh -huh. And I think we should we should reference um, not the, not the, not at the level of detail that there is in the letter, but reference his study um, on the importance of the resource 
of Sawmill Brook um, so that if the people in mass housing read all this material, um, which is questionable, um, that they would at least focus in on that. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> Do you think you have um, have a good place where you can fit that reference in? Yes, I, I can expand on the on the on that environmental degradation and and the criticalness of the water supply and the water resources of the area. Greg, similarly, Greg, um, is the uh, comments regarding uh, PFAS, PFAS mm -hmm. um, and the DEP, Mass DEP has a fairly ri uh, rigorous standard for that and that nothing in what SLV provided was going to was showing us that they were going to meet that in their uh, sewage treatment plant, their on-site right. sewage treatment. I, I think those two aspects of, of the uh, MEC letter, there are many, but those two aspects I think should be highlighted because that goes directly to um, water pollution. I think mass housing is much less concerned about what color the spotted salamander is. <coughs> um, but they, uh, the drinking water issues I think are, 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 are paramount here. Yeah, I think uh, I think I agree with you. <clears throat> other board members regarding other um, uh, commentary from the, those three major letters. All right, and let's go back to the differential between the tone of the existing letter and the addition of John Whitten's comments and uh, get to a landing, um, a landing ground here. So, First, we haven't decided to be a select board yet. Yeah, that's a long discussion. I thought I thought that we had, but uh, um, <clears throat> I find that, that there's victims around it. <clears throat> it has to go before town meeting. Ah. <clears throat> so fine, we can change that. Um, so. My personal feeling is 
I'm a little reluctant to you know actively attack mass housing in the tone of the language. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of the content um, articulating why um, one particular board rejected an application and mass housing should follow suit, I think is um, mm -hmm. That's not particularly objectionable then, but that's okay. I just, it's, I just don't think that um, something looks like a personal attack on mass housing should be coming from this board. And I'll put that out there as my primary um, comment and ask for, for uh, opinions from other board members. Well, we, we haven't walked in the shoes that John Witten has walked in, of course. But as, as I read it, I mean, I said, you know, at what point does something like that backfire on you? And and they they look at this and uh, they, they look at it as an affront. Now, Witten comes across as if hey, I probably he's probably done it before, and that's not the way they're going to take it because they get attacked all the time. I, I we don't know. But my initial reaction when I saw it is I wouldn't want to get a letter that's that inflammatory, but maybe that's what he does. But I understand it's it's the words are coming from you, Eli unless you sign that off as for the selectmen or select board, yeah. in which case then they're coming from all of us, but. Have, has, Eli, have you or Greg spoken with John regarding his letter? I have not. Yes. Yeah, I, I spoke to you him did. earlier. Um, no. I, I would, yeah, no, I'd like he, to know his. Okay. He's, he's, he purposely, you know, um, made it very aggressive just to sort of get your attention and to see your comfort level. He is certainly respectful of how, what tone you want to set. Um, he is also very candid to say he, he, he fully, he fully expects a project eligibility letter to be written. Yep. Uh, despite despite all the arguments that are, will be presented, he says that pro basically we'll get a letter that says, "Thank you for all of your concerns. We advise the applicant to address these concerns when they go before the local zoning board of appeals for their comprehensive." Mm -hmm. That's that's his prediction as to what kind of. A response we're going to get um, in the project eligibility letter. So well, it, even with that, yeah. he says it's still worth putting it in, but you you need to be comfortable with the with the tone and language. My feeling is that that the, it's wrong. The project is not right, and I I think that that to pussyfoot around around it is not going to do us any good. I mean, I, I not that, that we have to go smacking them, but I, I just feel that we need to be very strong in our wording and position and why we really we know this to be wrong from their perspective. there being mass housing. 
Yeah, I think I think that that's certainly something that we can get across without um, uh, going into uh, going straight straight for the eyes, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I have no problem presenting that um, uh, view. Other board members. What about the attacks on uh, Mr. Engler? Uh, similar. Uh, any any um, attacks that are, or any um, mm -hmm. language that is um, personal and, and, or, or could really be deemed as personal, I think I have... Um, some concerns about. I agree with that. I'm also I'd, not, I'm sorry, John, go yeah, ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I'm more concerned about that, I think probably that I'm in mass housing. Because if, if witness right, and I, I I I have no reason to doubt we're going to be seeing Mr. Engler again. But I, I, I don't I, think I, I don't know, John, that that um, some of the language that's in this um, is going to prevent us from seeing Engler. <laughs> I, but it did. Um, I, I, I understand John's experience and his frustration with um, mass housing. Um, uh, I, I think language like, you know, certain things are a stretch at best. I mean, that that's fine. Um, but some of the, some of the things that are in this um, you know, kind of indicate even even mass housing would agree with. Um, that's a little bit of a a problem mm -hmm. to me as well. One of the things I did like one of the lines was where it's where he said, "But it takes responsible government agencies to ensure that they are not given they being developers or." anyone with a bulldozer, the license to do so randomly and negligently. I, and then followed up by granting project eligibility approval for this project, the license is irresponsible for all the reasons noted in this letter, but perhaps most notably, notably because the project can neither be financed nor made financially feasible. I just think those are really good sentences. Yeah, I'm comfortable with those. That level of response I'm comfortable I'm not I, I I don't think the sort of cat and mouse baiting is is necessary some of the you know the sentences that do that but I think there are a lot of good on point comments. Um. I feel like I have enough guidance to 
when Greg edit um, and combine John's comments with what's here to uh, in a reasonable way that meets the meets the guidance that you all have provided so far. Um, I'm fine that, with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Specific sections that people, let's put it this way. If there are specific sections of, the, of John Witten's proposed language that you um, individually um, think are very appropriate, and should be retained in part or in whole. Can you um, uh, zip Greg an email with those? Mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't. I went. Uh, I would say hey, <laughs> by the end. Uh, uh, it's got to be in it by the end of the day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an awful lot of edit time. Uh, <laughs> left um, yeah i think we I removed the town meeting so <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to be my first free day so yeah it might be it yeah so i think the goal would be to have everybody an updated copy by um oh greg what do you think by um by the time we get to town meeting I was going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to aim to try to get it done by the end of the day on Monday before town meeting starts. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. At least give you a fighting chance to read it Monday morning or Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or even potentially um, uh, before then, we'll be technically in public session. You could, you could well, no, you couldn't. Never mind. <clears throat> um, mm. Yeah. Mike, right. I'll get it to you, you know, earlier in the afternoon on Monday. That's what I'll aim for. Other comments um, from board members. And I, uh, by the way, uh, there's, uh, I'm going to apologize to uh, members of the public that we're not going through a, a copy and presentation mode here, but it's got write-ups from John Whitten, and it's kind of be a little bit of a messy process. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through um, members of the public who are here. And um, if you have particular points where you want to ask if they have been covered in the letter, I'll address those. And if you um, find that they're not and have suggestions that um, and for ways that they be included, then uh, we'll discuss those briefly as well. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Just, just before you go to the public comments on this or, or questions about it, um, I just want to reiterate my deepest appreciation for the efforts that went into writing the letters that we received, um, the detail and, uh, and specificity of those letters is, um, is impressive and really helped me to um, make some of the comments that I made tonight. And I hope that I covered um, my own appreciation of those letters and I think the boards Hear him, hear him. Yes, hear, hear. Yep. All right, here we go. We're going to take a little spin through the public. Um, and uh, so if you have uh, questions about like, did you cover X, Y, or Z in the, in the letter? Or have you considered? We'll go over those in some detail. And if you, and if you find that they're not there or your comments or, your, or something that you think ought to be there, uh, we can we can consider it. We can discuss it tonight. We can discuss it. Probably we'll discuss it some tonight. Probably. Uh... All right. Uh, start with Gary Gilbert. Uh, thank you, Eli. Um, thanks to the board for their great care and and all your crafting. Um, uh, the planning board. We put together a letter we submitted to you, and um, we made a couple points in there that I think are tangible and have traction. And I don't know how prominent they are in the letter you guys have drafted, but I think 
well, there's a lot of things that the housing, uh, state housing board could ignore, but I think it's pretty real to address this issue of wanting an updated pro forma from the applicant. Um, a partially destroyed site from a failed, economically failed project is a big financial liability to the town, potentially a big financial liability to the town, as is what you would want to, what would we be able to do with a partially destroyed site? We'd have to bend over backwards and up zone or down zone the area just to get somebody to put something in there to make use of it afterwards. The potential impacts are, are pretty um, well tangible, potentially. And I don't know how much that's in the forefront of the letter you guys have drafted. Uh, the pro forma is not uh, in the forefront. However, what you're describing could be referenced fairly easily in the financial um, section. And uh, I think we could fit in a, a clause fairly easily to um, articulate that that's a concern of ours as one of the um, the financial issues. Sound about right, Greg? Yes, I would agree. Because the cost of materials and labor, we all know has gone bonkers. And um, well, certainly he doesn't want to start on a project that's gonna fail, but the town does run a real fiscal risk. Um, so. All right, we will, we will do something there. Danny Hall. Danny, you are muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you for all the work you guys do. Uh, to the most re the recent uh, Gary Gilbert's comment, the original pro forma was at $410,000 a unit. The most recent pro forma was, was at $510,000 a unit, I think, which was gonna make the equity investors on a good day a 2% return, which is probably not sustainable. But um, I guess I'd, I'd like to make one comment with regard to John Witten. Um, I can tell you from firsthand experience that DHCD and I, I think Mass Housing looks at him as a persona non grata. And while I think he's certainly aggressively representing the town, having his name of, associated with anything in that application probably doesn't do us any good. So I think that's something that, to take into consideration. And I, I agree with Eli, I don't think you win by you know, pers personalizing attacks. The, the, the question I have is pertains to the agenda and the mass architectural access board letter RE sidewalks. I don't think you, that, that the board has addressed that. Do you intend to do that? So I'd actually had some discussion about that agenda item. I think there was a well, and well, anyway, so what my intent is, I know that there was a request about this. What my intent is to cover the basic aspects of what the board plans to do with respect to sidewalks, with respect to its complete street policy in this letter to mass housing. And then to take the letter to mass housing and forward it to um, the architectural um, committee, as opposed to doing a separate letter, possibly with a, a cover letter describing, um, uh, as we've indicated to Mass Housing, um, uh, if this project goes forward, we do and um, expect, according to our policies, to be um, extending sidewalks to the area. Okay. Well, I think. Uh... My understanding is based on conversations with a gentleman at, at the Mass Architectural Access Board um, that they have the authority to require sidewalks if there, is, if there are sidewalk plans for sidewalks 
um, to the site. It's a, it's a nuance, but my understanding is it would require SLV to install sidewalks, which then becomes the issue, are they ADA compliant? And um, undoubtedly would increase the uh, projected cost of the project, which is already over $500,000 a unit as proposed. So I think it's relevant and I think it's important that the, that, uh, the, Man the Massachusetts Access Board, Architectural Access Board is fully aware of, of the town's intent to extend the sidewalks to the site in the event the project goes forward. Thank you. Hi, um, it's Ashley and I'm on a cell phone so I can't raise my hand. So please call on me when you have a chance. Uh, Danny, did we cover your uh, comments? Yes, thank you. Ashley, your turn. Thanks, Eli. Um, so just to follow on Denny's thought, my big concern, I guess it even ties into Gary Gilbert's, is the cost of the sidewalks is going to be immense with the ramp system um, and platforms that they'll need to create. And so even if they end up getting a project eligibility letter, I would like to make sure that we can somehow convince them to condition it upon the inclusion of sidewalks, because I worry that if it doesn't, you know, if they're not required at this early stage to include the sidewalks, then at the ZBA stage, when we go and force them to add them in, do they then get to say, oh, that's not economic? And I, I just wonder how having the sidewalks be added later in the game impacts that test of economic feasibility. Thanks. Um, I don't think I can answer that question tonight. Um, that is something I think that we would need to refer to John Whitten so we can uh, defensively construct some language around that and, and ask um, for the legal opinion in the meantime. Greg, do you know the answer to that? I'm guessing you don't. I, I don't know the detailed answer to that. Um... It's, uh, it's something I would like to do a little more homework on. Okay. All right. Um, Mike Dyer. Thanks, Eli. And um, thank you guys for uh, allowing us the opportunity to weigh in. Um, and we're grateful at uh, MECT that you've, uh, that you've really taken a letter seriously. Um, there are a couple of things in there that I, that I haven't heard in this discussion. And I, you know, I guess it's probably because we're flying blind. We, we don't, we can't see what documents you guys are looking at. But the two things I like to mention are that firstly, uh, destruction of habitat. Uh, and we allude to this in the letter, the fact that they have to blast the top off this hill and just profoundly uh, really destroy the, uh, the habitat and the, the trees, everything that's on that mm -hmm. hill, uh, and the effects that it has on all those resources that are nearby, all the conservation land that's, that's, that abuts it and uh, that's proximate to it, which is owned by the town itself, by the trustees of reservations, and by MECT. Um, I don't know if Mass Housing cares about such things, but that's that to us is a, is a very important point. And the second thing we mentioned, um, and again, I don't know if you uh, folks have covered this in your draft, but it's, the, it's Mass Housing's concept of typology. And we looked at that and thought about it for a while. They, they, they refer to it as adjacent building typology. Uh, in this case, there are no adjacent buildings. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. In our view, that is not good typology. And it's, it's neither is a good typology that this building is by far the largest building in town other than the two school buildings, I think. It's totally out of scale and, and we think inappropriate typology wise. Um, that was the other thought that we had to offer and uh, I hope you'll consider it. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, we will. So we, we, we um, do have a section on environmental degradation and we note the impact of, um, well, it's, it's in the whole areas and environment is in the environmentally sensitive area that it shares um, boundary lines with conservation known areas owned by the town and by you folks and trustees of reservation. And uh, there are significant wetlands there uh, as well as unmapped vernal pools. And um, we discussed the impact of blasting and the volume of blasting and uh, the impact of uh, Water runoff, uh, or yeah, water runoff and uh, the uh, runoff and the blasting. <clears throat> um, um, and the specific aspects of the typology that you're referring to, we don't refer to in here. Um, I think we can. I think we can make a reference to it in um, in the environmental degradation section and refer out to the MECT letter. Um, we could we could do that. I think, Greg. What do you think? Yeah. No. I, I was. I was just jotting some notes here where what would fit in and we can make that reference. We have yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, maybe what will hmm. So I'm, I'm sensitive to um, people, um, the fact that folks um, in the audience are blind. Uh, we don't have it up in presentation <laughs> mode right now. Um, and um, I think it would be um, feasible for us to send out uh, where we're referencing documents written by um, MECT, for example, that it would be feasible and reasonable for us to send a draft out for um, you folks to look at um, ahead of the next meeting that we have. Greg, do you do you think that's a reasonable thing to do? Yes, we can. I'm just my my only hesitation is, is is timing here. But if people don't. Uh, people, as long as people appreciate that it's going to be a little bit at the last minute and it will be a lot of time for review before you're, you need to finalize it Tuesday night. Yeah, well, we're not going to be taking major um, edits, but it'll <laughs> give people an opportunity to um, pick and choose their battles. And remember that they're, the individual letters uh, from each of your organizations will go in our package and be referenced by a, a cover letter of some sort. Um, Eli, sorry to uh, chime in again. Um, could I ask one more question? Sure, Ashley, go ahead. Thanks, Eli. Um, I was wondering if in your letter, you had a chance to discuss that um, there is an aquifer that sits right under the site, which could potentially, you know, is referenced in our um, open space recreation plan, or I, I can't remember the name of the plan, but um, as a potential future water supply and those wells, is there room to include that? Um, as a consideration that this site would impact a future water supply and past public water supply? Um, I'm gonna pass that one on to um, uh, board members to discuss. My, my only concern there is 
Um, that gets a little bit more into the speculative side of things as opposed to things that we have very, um, very well defined backing for. Um, board members, how do you feel about uh, adding uh, a reference to that? Eli, if I may. Yeah, Becky. Um, I think we all know that water is only going to become more precious. Um, and and I, 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 don't, I don't think it hurts to reference that there's an aquifer there. I don't think, don't know that we have to say that it's, you know, a potential water resource at some point. But the fact that I think we can just simply state there is a, a, an aquifer there. Does that make sense? It makes yeah. sense to me, uh, Becky. I, I, you know, I think that I mean we say critical water resources, and I think that that could be expanded a little bit and to name a few names. Obviously, we are referencing what's in the in the documents that are provided, and you don't want to repeat things in detail too much, but I think that we could expand what those critical resources are within the letter and include an aquifer with, and I wouldn't go much more than that because the supporting information is gonna provide that. Yeah. Okay. What, what we had said in section two, which is probably moving to the environmental section is, um, as it serves as a major water recharge area serving the town's principal drinking water well. And I, I think speculating on places where things that it might affect, things that we might use later that uh, we're not currently using um, lowers the impact of this site now, this project now threatens our current water supply. Could threaten it. Does threaten. Does threaten. It, it, it needs to be uh, done carefully uh, uh, and with great attention to detail and great regulation. Otherwise, it certainly would be a problem for our water supply. Right. Unregulated, it would be a significant problem, I think. I still think we could mention the aquifer, mm -hmm. but I do agree with Dan. We don't we don't want to minimize the the immediate as what's critical immediately. But I still think that that could play in. No, Aunt, what do you um, what do you think? Something that might help Gloucester sometime in the future just isn't as compelling to me as putting chemicals into the Lincoln Street well. Fair. I don't know whether anybody's actually going to read any of this, um, but I'd like to make the strongest arguments we can. Succinctly. Yes, just the word. Yeah. Yep, I I agree with succinct. Jeff, any comments? Saza? Uh, no, I just want to be succinct. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I know we're concerned about um, raising these points, um, I'm just concerned that the more detail there is in the letter on technical points, or this, this is not really a technical point, but um, the, the 
more likely that it'll be missed. Um, and, I, and I think that, that emphasizing that this is our water supply that we feel is threatened. Um, and that in this whole process of eight months of nine months of negotiation, depending on when you start it um, and when it ended, I, I would say six months, um, we were not given access to specifics about the functioning of their water treatment that reassured me that these issues would be addressed. And they may say, okay, that's a zoning board issue. That's something that was mentioned a number of times, but um, I, I think simpler is better. Reference the documents, and if they want to learn more, they can look at the documents. Okay. Other members of the public with comments? All right. Um, Next time we do this, the on the 22nd, the meeting is going to be entirely dedicated to going through just the document um, in, in its entirety. And I think at that point, we probably will do this in presentation mode because we'll, we'll be working on a, a final draft at that point. Yes. Um, and if folks from... Um, SEMA or MUCT um, or other major um, contributors or writers of letters um, want to have a preview of that draft letter. What I would suggest is you contact um, Greg and uh, uh, we'll uh, see about getting a, a copy out. Um, uh, it was something that's uh, close to in good shape as possible. Um, all right, uh, board members, any other additional comments on this particular topic before we move on? All right. We're going to take a quick pause and wait for Greg to come back from um, whatever animal he was chasing around and uh, <laughs> on to our next agenda. All I had a groundhog show up on my deck the other day. He was kind of poking his head up and looking inside the house like he wanted to come in. He was so cute, but I know he's going to destroy practically everything. <laughs> hey, Greg. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Item number five on the agenda. We have two things in there. One's the board select meeting minutes from June 7th, and one is a touch a track, touch a truck event scheduled for July 29th with a rain date of August 5th. Uh, does anybody have any comments from the board? Uh, have any comments on either of those items? No minutes, right? Huh? What? I thought it said that there were no minutes. I didn't oh. see any. I'm sorry, no minutes. Uh, it's, just, it's just a touch of truck. Yep, 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 sorry. I move that we approve the touch, the consent agenda as presented. Second. Any discussion? 
All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Bob McTurney. Yes. Ms. Jakes. I love such a truck. <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. So that's a yes from Ms. Jakes and Mr. Bowling votes yes. Item number six on the agenda, town administrator. Hmm? Town administrator support. Uh, yes, very briefly, um, rapidly closing, coming to the end of the fiscal year, uh, June 30th. Uh, we will be needing your uh, approval for some transfers, um, principally in, in fire and police salaries for um, some, uh, some injuries and extra overtime um, were required. And so we do need some dollars transferred there, um, as well as um, in our legal professional services. Um, uh, a lot of that's related to the to the 40B review. Um, so we'll have those numbers for you at your first meeting in July. Um, the, the question of or the issue of, of traffic calming continues to persist. Um, it's we, we haven't been addressing uh, uh, for a while the issue of um, you know ways to calm traffic either with speed tables or more crosswalks, speed signs, that sort of thing. I know that obviously we've been preoccupied with a lot of other things, but I think it's a topic that we'll be needing to, um, to revisit um, in, the, in the coming months. Um, and we do have um, uh, one, one bid we received for the uh, compost uh, project uh, at the transfer station. Uh, we are in the process of, of going through that proposal carefully uh, we'll be meeting with the um, with the proposer to go over it in some more detail as we try to um, see if we can um, move move this project forward in a way that's uh, equitable for the town and, and moves us in a good direction. Um, there are some challenges. Uh, uh, you mentioned price increases. The, the cost of this project has has grown significantly, um, so we are struggling with that. But we will continue to try to. Um, bring something to you in fairly short order so that we um, can make a final decision on that. Um, so I think uh, those are the highlights I wanted to bring. Obviously, a town meeting uh, on Monday and hope to see uh, see a, a nice crowd gather. It's, uh, the weather forecast is looking pretty good. Uh, it'll be warm. Bring, bring a bottle of water <laughs> because we will be sitting in the, in the sun. Um, you know, be setting fairly soon, but uh, it is the longest day of the year as well. So um, uh, people should be uh, be prepared for the weather. But uh, hopefully, it'll it'll draw a good crowd. Okay. Uh -oh. Oh, excuse me. I hate it when that happens. All right. Um, I have no other matters as may not have been reasonably anticipated by the chair. So unless there's anything else from other board members, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yes. All right. Roll call vote. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Bob Returner. Mr. Bob Returner. Okay. Unmuted. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ms. Jakes. Yes, please. Mr. Bowling votes yes as well. All right, good night, folks. We'll see you at uh, town meeting, and then we'll see you again on Tuesday, the 22nd.